Hey, Rick, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very fine. And thank you very much for coming on to the guitar show. This is uh, your total hero, legend and, and influence of mine. So thank you. Well, and you're too kind because uh, I love your playing as well. And I've always looked, enjoyed uh, your videos and your little presentations that you do. Very informative and, uh, and knowledgeable. I like it. Thanks very much. So I just wondered if we could kind of start at the beginning. How did you uh, first pick up the guitar and what were your early influences? Well, uh, you know, I was, I've been around since the uh, onset of uh, rock and roll. So obviously everybody who saw Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis on TV and, you know, Chuck Berry, which I did, uh, you know, we wanted to kind of emulate that a little bit. My mother had a, uh, a little Oahu lap acoustic guitar that she had taken lessons on as a girl. So I'd grab that thing and bop around the living room and they, they saw that I was interested and they got me uh, a rental Stella guitar and, and some lessons and I just stayed with it. Wow. And who were your influences? What, what were you listening to around that time? Dwayne Eddy, Chuck Berry, uh, and, you know, any, anybody that came on TV, because I was in a town called Philadelphia, and uh, Dick Clark's uh, American Bandstand was on every day after school, and he presented all the national acts, all the rock and roll guys. So whoever came on with a guitar, uh, you know, I loved that. And, uh, and later, when I got a little older, I got into, you know, the, when the Beatles and the Stones hit, I got into learning a lot from, from records and the Stones and, and so on. It just was a natural progression from them to the blues artists, etc. I know, uh, and this is something that you and I have actually talked about sort of um, before, that you were more influenced by Michael Bloomfield than you were Eric Clapton. At first, very much so, yeah. My, my two guys that I really, well, that, my three guys were Chuck Berry, uh, Mike Bloomfield, and, and uh, Keith Richard, you know, around 15, 16 years old. And I didn't hear Clapton until uh, I was almost 18. Uh, I might have heard something from the Yardbirds, but didn't know it was him or anything. When I first heard Clapton, I was like, yeah, that's good, but he, he's not as good as Mike Bloomfield. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, as I listened more, I, I was able to pick out the nuances of what made each one of these players great. Because I guess the thing was with Clapton, he, you know, he was in London in 1965, 66, so he didn't have the opportunity to see these, you know, to just go down to a club, you know, and see these, you know, great Chicago blues artists. Right. Um, and also, you know, we didn't get mail. We got cream before we got mail, it seems like. Uh, so people first heard of Clapton with cream and then they went back and got the Beano record and, and then Peter Green and Mick Taylor followed and all that. That's, that's actually really interesting that they heard cream first. You know, that's not something I would have um, sort of, you know, thought about, but it's true, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure there were some aficionados who were aware of mail, but I think it was mail didn't really hit here until cream hit. <laughs> cream hit pretty hard. What was Long your first, sorry, Rick, what was your first electric guitar? Was it Gibson ES-125 thick body? Uh, oh, wow. early 50s and had a little came with a little birch wood uh alamo amplifier which i wish i still had i wish i had both of those things like it was the follow-up to the charlie christian looking guitar got you but, i know uh, which one is the ornamentation you know it was pretty much a basic electric guitar with one p90 in the neck sunburst and, and so Rick, how did you go from so you're, you're you're into the blues you've got all these influences how did you go take that into sort of a professional sort of environment what was your first sort of pro gig as it was well i did i was semi-professional at first my my parents owned a nightclub and uh, and in during the summer on weekends the band who would play during you know every night would also do jam sessions what they call jam sessions uh, in the afternoon so I got to, with my little band, got to play the 20 minutes that they took off in between each set. So we, 
we would play there. And then later I joined a band that uh, played nightclubs in Philadelphia when I was still in high school. So, and then in college, again, we played frat parties and, and uh, I guess my first professional gig opening up for somebody was opening up for, uh, the first night was John Hammond Jr. And the second night was Muddy Waters Band. And uh, so that, that led me to uh, meeting some of these people that who were really in show business, you know, big time people. And uh, when I met Delaney and Bonnie and friends in 1970, they encouraged me to move to California, to Los Angeles, and if I really wanted to get into the music business. So I've been listening to your, I think it was your last album that you actually released in 2019, Soul Shaker. Was that, is that your last album? Yes, that's the most recent one that's been released. And I really love your slide tone and your slide technique and everything about your slide playing. I love the fact that, because really my favorite um, slide players always put the slide on their fourth finger. Yes. As you do. And, you know, as Raikuda does. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Bonnie Ray pl- plays it on uh, on this finger, right. and uh, it, I've seen a lot of other people that do too. And yeah, I can do that. It's it, it does it does something nice, but um, I find that I'm able to play rhythm better with those two fingers there, and then go to the slide like this. Mm-hmm. So, so that the question was for me was how did you? you know, who, who inf- um, introduced you to the slide guitar? Was it somebody or an artist that you were listening to? Uh, I was uh, playing with a guy called Rick Valenti. I'm still friends with him. He's a, he was an amazing harp player singer who uh, opted not to go into the business, but he still performs occasionally here and there around the Philadelphia area. Anyway, he was over at my house one day and I was in my room and I hear the slide guitar coming out of the kitchen. And I said, what who's that you know what record is that and here it's rick he knew how to play the walk and blues in g tuning by robert johnson i said man you got to show me that and uh, <laughs> since that day i've been fascinated and hypnotized by the slide I, I, what what tuning do you use do you use what's your favorite sort of tuning well, go to tuning is these days is e i can play in in a easily i can play in all keys it there's, uh, I can play in B with some open strings that has mm-hmm. a very nice quality to it. Also, it's just very versatile. Yeah, he choose. So, um, just just going back slightly. So, um, because I mean, you've you've played with so many artists, but and you've got this solo career as well, and you've you've released a number of your own sort of albums. And um, what is that something that you've always done right from the get go? I always wanted to. I mm-hmm. was. You know, Part of developing a thick skin was dealing with the amazing number of times that I was turned down and rejected. <laughs> so when I finally got with uh, Fleetwood Mac later on, uh, I did some demos and put Stevie Nicks's voice on it, on the mm-hmm. demos. And uh, she played a couple of those things for the guys at Atlantic Records and uh, they offered me a deal as a result of that. And uh, my first record came out in 1992. Mm-hmm. And Stevie was on a couple of tracks uh, with me, but uh, wow. then uh, I was able to, through the years, uh, hook up with uh, various labels, uh, especially a label in, in Germany called Hypertension, put out a lot of my music in Europe. What's that first album called King of Hearts? It was. Yeah. So maybe that's one thing our viewers should check out. Um, you know, maybe um, check out Rick's first album, King of Hearts, but also his latest one, which is Soul Shaker, two excellent albums, which you need to have in your collection. Um, so tell me about that, that um, Fleetwood Mac. How did that, you know, because I know that we, we might go sort of, you know, into the future and into back, but how did the Fleetwood Mac thing happen? How did that? Uh, I had uh, I'd known Billy Burnett for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Billy was always saying to me, man, I got to get you on one of my albums. I got to get you on some of my music, man. I really like the way you play. I said, fine. And I went over to a friend's house, John Heron, who's passed away now, but a mutual friend of Billy's and mine. And I said, what are you doing tonight? And he said, well, I'm going to go play on a Billy Burnett session and Mick Cleet was going to be on it. I said, let's get him on the phone. I said, Billy, I'm coming and playing on your session tonight. You don't have to pay me. 
let's get this let's get this done you've been saying he said oh yeah yeah man you gotta come so uh kind of hit it off with, off with mick we talked a lot about peter green in the old days and uh my having seen the band in philadelphia uh with peter and danny Kerwan and that that version of the band uh this was uh, right around the time their second record um was being released in the states and of course, it was phenomenal and, and a huge influence on my direction, I would say, in music. And he liked all that. And again, uh, I guess it was a couple of months later, he and Billy came out to a club I was playing in and sat in with me. And we played some, some of the old stuff, you know, Elmer James and all that. And then uh, Lindsay left abruptly like that. And uh, I got a call from Mick asking if I wanted to learn a few of the songs and come down and play with the band. Uh, Cause Billy was going to be coming and doing that. So of course I said, yes. And uh, I think it was my knowledge of the original Fleetwood Mac music, which had, had not been a part of the band's music for a long time. That was what I was able to bring to the table. Plus I was able to play the, the 70s stuff. Mm -hmm. So you kind of had like the modern sound, but you also you knew what happened before. Yeah. Yes. And and when you were, uh, this is something that you and I have also talked about before, <laughs> which is an amazing, like one of the most amazing stories uh, you could possibly have as a guitar player. Um, you found two very special guitars, didn't you, when you were on tour with them? Do you want to tell us when about I, the, the... When I was on tour with Fleetwood Mac, yes. Yeah. Do you want to just tell our viewers about that quickly? <laughs> yes, sure. It was probably the most amazing find of all times that I know of. Anyway, I was in uh, Cincinnati on a night off. It was the night before we have Thanksgiving here. Do you have Thanksgiving? Yeah, uh, is that like kind of Christmas, isn't it? Well, is it, it's, it? uh, it's celebrate when the pilgrims came over and, and broke oh. bread with the Indians. and, and right. this, it's, it's a great family time, but I was on the road. The next night was, was Thanksgiving, and so I had a night off. And I went to this club to hear a blues band and it, uh, it was a really cool band. The, the, the lead guy was named uh, Big Ed. And, uh, and I'm sitting having a drink with a friend of mine. We're digging the band. And all of a sudden, I looked up on the stage because I, I couldn't see him well. At first, he was sitting sideways, sort of. He couldn't see his guitar. And I noticed he was playing an explorer. And the closer I looked, I, w I said, oh, my gosh, that's a real explorer. That's a <laughs> That's an original Explorer. So I waited till they were finished the, uh, the set and I uh, uh, talked to Big Ed and uh, I said, how is it that no one has tried to buy that from you in all these years? Because he had it since it was new in 59, I think he said he got it. He said, well, everybody talks about buying it, but nobody's ever showed me any money. I said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and listen. I wouldn't, I would never even, uh, you know, bring this up to you, but if, if the money would do you any good, if you have any, any, you know, thoughts of selling it, I said, I'll be honest with you. I'm having a really good year this year and I'd like to buy it, but why don't we do this tomorrow's Thanksgiving. You won't be working. I won't be working. Think about it for 24 hours. I'll call you tomorrow night and we can discuss it. And so we waited and <laughs> I called him the next night after dinner and uh, I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, I'll sell it under one condition. I said, what's that? He said, when I got this, my brother got the flying V at the same time. You got to buy both of them. Crazy. He had an original 58 Explorer and an original 58 flying V. So uh, <laughs> I, we agreed on a, on a hefty price, and uh, and I got it. <laughs> That's it. What an incredible! Did you ever play them in um, Fleetwood Mac or ever record with them? The, the V. I never played the Explorer much. I I, I was really into the V, and uh, and I, I used the V on, on some live gigs, not with Fleetwood Mac because they they weren't playable to my standard at that point in time. When I got them, I had to uh, bring them back to Los Angeles and. The V was, was, I wasn't even sure where they were going to be able to make that thing work. It had been sitting in a damp uh, basement. It was completely rusted out. 
you couldn't turn a knob or anything like that. So I took a chance on that one, but uh, after we brought it to the right fella, he got him up and running. Wow. So I That's... laid music on my own music. Uh, but just quickly, um, Maria Maldor, you, you played, you performed with Maria Maldor, and I, I love Maria Maldor. Hey. Yeah, I mean, I, I just remember as a kid hearing, obviously, the famous song, Midnight at the o Oasis, and yeah. then hearing, because my mum had it on vinyl, and, and hearing the, um, the Amos Garrett beautiful solo on that, and then flipping it over, and that was the first time I ever saw Raikuda and heard his name, Raikuda, was when I was, like, 14. I had this, my mum had the album. I just remember he had a, a photo of Amos Garrett and a photo of Raikuda on the back of the album. Two and of I was the like, best guitar players that ever, uh, <laughs> ever plugged in. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah. And I got, I got into a, a record by Maria and Jeff Moldar called Sweet Potatoes that came out before her solo career. And Amos was on that. And it, if you ever get a chance to find that record, right. there's some of the best songs and the best playing. Uh, you'll 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 hear if you like that uh, Amos Garrett touch and yeah so yes I, later on I met her through Bonnie great and uh and I went on tour with her went to Japan and uh met Aris, uh, Amos and got to play with Amos on stage one night with Maria and wow. uh, yeah I played on a, on a few of her records and she's covered a few of my songs We're incredible so yeah she's a great lady oh that's amazing if we talk about Bonnie Raitt, we can link this with the other kind of the big sort of clickbait buzzword at the moment, Dumble, <laughs> which has been going for the last yeah. 10, 20 years. Um, I'm actually very, uh, I'm, I'm very good friends with Henry Kaiser, who's, um, who's, who, who used his amps. And um, yeah, so how did you first become aware of Dumble? What was the... I was on tour with Bonnie and I met... Uh, Howard Dumble in Santa Cruz. He was still up in Santa Cruz at this time. And he said, uh, man, I like the way you play. I sure like, would like to hear you play through one of my amps. I said, well, really? Tell me about him. He said, well, you know, David Lindley uses one, Jackson Brown. And I said, is that the sound that, you know, he gets through coming through your amp? I said, I love that. You know, I would love to, uh, to play through one of your amps sometimes. So uh, later, I guess later that year, I switched gigs to Jackson Brown and went to rehearsal and there was this line of Dumble amps. And uh, I had brought my own amps. I was using a, a amp called a Rissan, which was made out in California at the time. Pretty good sounding amp. And, uh, and Jackson said, hey, listen, I like your sound, but try it through this amp here. <laughs> and he puts up this... Uh, 100 watt uh, overdrive special with reverb. And I plugged into that and I said, oh, I get what all the, what all the fuss is about here. <laughs> and so, uh, so I started playing that amp exclusively for, for you know, the next 20 years. Wow. And, uh, and he actually gave, later gave me that amplifier, very same Incredible. one. And uh, so, yeah. I, once you play through a, a good dumble um, and a good set of speakers, uh, it, it will change you and it'll change the way you play. And um, you were around um, at the time when, um, because Steve Ray Vaughan was offered some studio time, wasn't he, with Jackson Brown for his yeah. first, first ever album. Yeah. Do you, were, were you around about that time or do you know anything about that session? I, I know a lot about the session. And I know a lot about how he got there because uh, I was on tour with Jackson in the summertime and we were, I think, in, well, somewhere in Europe. And uh, this guy came on the bus. Jackson and I were sitting in the back of the bus, maybe jamming or talking about something. And this, this guy's name was Chesley Milliken. I always remember his name. It was such an interesting name. And we got to talking. I think he was an Irish fellow. And Jackson said, um, so what are you doing now? And he said, well, imagine this guy. He's Jimmy Bonds from the fabulous Thunderbirds brother named Stevie Ray Vaughan. And, and he said, 
he's really great. One of the great, greatest guitar players. And we've tried a lot of stuff, but we just haven't gotten the sound that really captures his sound yet. And we have interest here and there, you know, maybe Columbia, you might've mentioned Columbia Records, but we gotta, we gotta get some better recordings. And Jackson said, well, look, we, when are you gonna be in LA? Cause we have some time off and we're gonna take a break from the record we were making. And you could bring the band in there and use, use my studio, which was like a rehearsal hall studio thing. And that's what happened. Um, um, he went into the studio there in, in LA. I know before that happened, we, we did Montro. Right. We played Montro and Chesley again was there and Stevie was playing there. And, and we did our set and I went back to the hotel <laughs> and, uh, my friend Bob Glob, the bass player, called me in the hotel and he said, hey man, you gotta come down and hear this guy, Stevie, Stevie Vaughn. And he wants you to sit in with him. He's heard you play and he, he really likes you playing. He wants you to sit in with him. I said, well, what's he play like? He said, well, he's kind of loud. He's a little bit like Hendrix. I said, I don't know. I've heard all these guys that play like Hendrix. And I, said, I just, you know, I've seen Hendrix. Three times up wow. close, first start of his career. I don't really like the Hendrix. He said, well, he's Jimmy Vaughn's brother, so he plays a lot of blues. I said, Jimmy Vaughn, that guy wouldn't even let me borrow his amp. Mine broke on a gig one time. I said, wow. I don't want to have anything to do with this. So I never went, I never went to meet him. I could have sat in. We may have even become friends, yeah. but it didn't happen. That, that was the, the one that got away, sort of. But anyway, yeah, he did come and make Texas Flood record at Jackson Studio. I believe he may have played through my amp. I know he played through the Steel String Singer there. And we had a whole whole line of uh, Dumble Air. So, so, so he didn't, in your opinion, because a lot of people are thinking that he played through a bass, a Dumble bass amp, but in your opinion, did he play through a Steel String Singer? Was it more likely of him to play through a Steel String Singer than a bass amp? I remember talking with the engineer once and he said that he knew he played through the steel string singer and he right. might have played through mine also because they were trying out the amps but that's as, that's as close as i got to it because I, I i wasn't uh, of course i wasn't going to go i didn't really know the guy yeah. or anything so and he you know he he was he was just a guy then he yeah he was, yeah you know, it was years before he became an icon yeah I'm going to come to your playing in a minute, but just just to finish off the the Dumble sort of thing, um, you know, because I know that Clapton's now using uh, a couple of um, Fender sort of tweed amps that Dumble's modified, and because Dumble's not, yeah, he, I don't think he's making the Overdrive Special model anymore. But what he's doing is getting Fender amps, gutting them, and then sort of rebuilding them with. Good well, parts, that's yeah. what he was doing when I met him in Santa Cruz. Right. He was, right. they were mostly Fender amps that he, he modded up, you know. Mm -hmm. made a, may have made a couple of the little 112 models. In fact, I sent you a review that I did yes. of uh, an overdrive special. No one knew who those amp, uh, what those amps were or anything right. about them at that point. Incredible. Um, so just talking about your 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 actual playing style, because I've heard you play some beautiful sort of almost sort of ethnic um, sounds, and have you? I mean, what kind of things do you listen to for your inspiration in in terms of playing and also, you know, songwriting? How do you keep things fresh? And you know, what's your process for songwriting and, and playing the guitar? And well, you know, I'm sitting right now in my dining room, and for some reason the mojo, it floats around this room or something. I've written more songs and worked out more riffs and stuff in this room than I think anywhere. But I listened to, you know, of course I started off listening to blues music and the, and the Elmer James and, uh, you know, Brian Jones on Little Red Rooster. That oh, was probably my the first, the first uh, slide I ever heard was probably that. Amazing. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and Tampa Red on the, on the acoustic slide and um, Robert Nighthawk, he was incredible. Wow. And then I, um, maybe about a dozen years ago, I um, 
Rai put out that record about uh, the meeting at the river with Mohan Bhatt, I think, playing mm -hmm. Indian slide. And, and I thought Mohan Bhatt dominated that record. And then I got one of his uh, tapes, you know, and, 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 and I started listening to him and getting into, uh, you know, Ravi Shankar a little more because I started realizing that, hey, what these guys are playing is all kind of the same, Ali Akbar Khan on the Sarod, you know, and I started to just get that sound in my head mm -hmm. and, and started applying that a little bit to the slide guitars as best I could. I don't know. I still don't know anything technically about that music. I just know how a little bit of it sounds. And I started that's writing that, yeah. my own songs, you know, to, to fit that style. And uh, so I've got probably uh, a couple rep a couple whole records full of uh you know, original tunes that I've written, you know, with a little bit of an Indian feel, a little bit of a Middle Eastern feel, and combining that with, with a little bit of blues. And I don't know what I'm doing with it, but it's, it, you know, <laughs> I know it's mine. Beautiful. No, it sounds, I was really, I was really impressed. And I think the viewers need to check out your, your albums because it's very, it's, it's very unique and uh, innovative um, from what Thank a lot you. of, because a lot, you know, this is the thing I love about your style is a lot of people tend to sound the same or they tend to, you know, there tends to be like one player that everybody copies, you know, whereas I, I'm, I much prefer. Yeah, I much prefer players like yourself who you've got your own style. You've got your own way of doing things. That's really what, what yeah. I love. You know? I mean, that's about the best compliment you could you could pay me to, to if you, you think I sound like me, then I, then mm. I, then I guess the time put in may have been worth it. Yeah, but it's even like Bonnie Raitt. I love Bonnie Raitt's slide playing because she doesn't sound like everyone else. No, she sounds like Bonnie yeah. Raitt right yeah. away. You know, it's her. Ry Cooter sounds like Ry Cooter. Yeah. David Lindley sounds like David Lindley. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Yeah. We all we all spend time learning different players. I mean, I, 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 I'm an amalgamation of probably 50 different guys, you know, that I've listened to throughout the years. And I can... Turn them, off, turn them on or turn them off as far as the, the degree of, of their style that I'll put into a solo or whatever like that. But the more I listen to music, even, even the vanguards took inspiration from other people and, and incorporated something of someone else into their playing, you know. Of course, yeah. On or, or at whatever point. And Rick, what is your setup at the moment? What guitars? I know you're um, almost sort of the ambassador for Reverend Guitars. What what guitar? What drew you to those particular guitars, and what and what amplifiers are you using at the moment? Um, uh, here's a guitar that I, I've had for a long time. Oh, it's wow! Two Pro Dual Tone. <laughs> I've always loved the Supro and airline guitars. So uh, when I got with uh, Reverend, uh, we developed a pickup on my signature model that kind of was single coil like this. This looks like a humbucking pickup, but they're single coil pickups in the old Supro guitars. And um, so we, we created a pickup that, that got that tone and we paired that with P90 in the neck. And, um, so I've been with Reverend about 20 years because we work together on different stuff and I've had three signatures out. And this is, this is my latest one. It's called Soul Shaker. It's like the title of the record. And yeah. uh, this one has got uh, their humbuckings in it. My, the one that came out before this had the, uh, the Supro uh, influence sound. Um, but, you know, we're always looking for something that's that's really playable high quality that just sounds great and if you lose it or break it you can mm -hmm. replace it yeah not not like a um 58 explorer no sir <laughs> there's a no. couple of uh, stores i think one in london or close to london and one up in scotland that, that does a lot of reverend yeah uh, models oh nice fantastic yeah. 
I mean, they they also did. Um, they even had their own amplifiers and speakers, right? Didn't they? They used to have. Uh, yeah, that was the second part of your question. I love. Uh, two, there's two amplifiers that they had out. One was called the King Snake. It's a little 112 combo, and a, and and the King Snake's little brother called the Goblin, which was 110, and uh, very versatile amps, extremely toneful record really well. You put a mic in front of it, it works every time and uh, really great on live shows. And uh, they don't make them anymore. Uh, so oh. that's one to keep your eyes out for. What's your plans for the future, Rick? What, what, what are your plans in terms of like, because you're living in Nashville at the moment, aren't you? Franklin, Tennessee, which is Franklin. probably about half an hour from Nashville, um, a, different, a different world. <laughs> close, <laughs> close, but so far away. <laughs> yeah, uh, I yeah. Since uh, you know, I did the um, the tribute to Peter Green concert in London about a year and a half ago. With, that yeah, with of Nick course. Fleetwood and friends. That and was amazing. I've been, because of COVID, I guess, and all this, uh, it's been just in my own studio recording. So I do have a. a re- a finished record, which mm-hmm. this time will combine uh, more of that um, uh, world, let's call it world beat sound right. uh, that you right. alluded to earlier with, with, with some bluesier things that, you know, we're, we're kind of blending here. And uh, so that's finished. And um, I have been talking with uh, a nice label. We'll, we'll just see what happens. Amazing. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to that next year. And we have a new Reverend signature coming out, which is going to be sort of retaining a little bit of the old model and um, a little bit more input from Reverend on this one. And um, so we have to, to look forward to. Incredible. Let's finish on, um, because just from what you've just said, um, about the, the concert, the Peter Green concert. Let's let's finish on that because that was a really special event that you came over to London to perform at with some, yeah. you know, uh, and and really um, you performed with some very famous artists. And <laughs> you came, it was, a, well, Mick Flick, uh, Mick, Mick Fleetwood was sort of, uh, well, you were the MD, uh, apparently as, from, from, Everything I've heard, it sounds like you were the musical director of the whole thing. I, you know, I, technically, I wasn't the musical director because, to tell you the truth, Mick and I had gone our separate ways a couple of years prior, and uh, and there was another a keyboard player named Ricky, Rick, I guess his last name, uh, who was the MD. But right. uh, at the last minute, in fact, Christmas Day, he called me about a. Uh, a month, or two or three weeks before rehearsals had started in on Maui, and asked if uh, we could sort of mend fences and and, be, and me be a part of this thing because, uh, I mean, I probably played that music more often than anybody with Mick anyway. Yeah, and, you know, we've been doing that music in the Mick Fleetwood Blues Band for ten years. Yes, and so when I came aboard, um, I sort of became the unofficial. MD, at least from the guitar standpoint, mm-hmm. because so many guitar players on that show. We had, yeah. you know, Dick Gilmore and Andy Fairweather Lowe, Johnny Lang, uh, uh, Billy Gibbons, Pete Townsend, you know, the list went on, you know, Jeremy Spencer. So it was, it was helpful for me to, you know, to just suggest little things here and there without getting overbearing. I must say that everybody that played on that gig checked their egos at the door and truly wanted to be there uh, to pay their respects to Peter, who was still alive at the time. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that show was just what, probably one of the most amazing shows I've ever been a part of. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it was incredible. And you had the um, uh, St- Tyler from Aerosmith singing as well, didn't you? Steven Tyler, yeah. Steven Tyler. So it's yeah. incredible. What a, what a lineup. I mean, that's like a once in once in a lifetime sort of um, event and it, has that been released on cinema hasn't it is it, is it out on cinema is that yes there's there's a, a fabulous box set package uh, mm-hmm. that has you know a booklet with great photos and uh, bluetooth dvd and cd and 
um, mm -hmm. just, you know, really well done package. And have you ever met Eric Clapton? Yes. When you I have. was on tour with Bonnie Raitt um, that I'd mentioned earlier, we, we did a whole tour opening for Eric Clapton. So Incredible. I to speak with him a couple of times. The reason I mentioned that is I, I saw um, on there's some footage on, on YouTube of Peter Green and the Splinter Group's first ever concert. And, and it was kind of like his first concert sort of since, you know, Fleetwood Mac broke up, I guess. I know he'd done some recording in between. But um, they, they played at a place called Guildford. It was a Guildford Blues Festival near London. And, of course, Eric Clapton lives in near Guildford, apparently. And he shows up. Eric Clapton kind of shows up at that gig. And it's like Peter Green's first concert back. And obviously, Peter is not quite the man, you know, in some respects that he was. But it's, it's, it's really cool that Eric Clapton actually took the trouble to show up and, you know, pay, you know, it was like, you know, Peter's come back. I want to be there, you know? I, I think that, uh, I didn't realize it, but he has tremendous respect for Peter. In fact, mm -hmm. right now I saw a video on YouTube just the other day and he plays an acoustic version of Black Magic Woman in, in tribute to mm -hmm. Peter. So yeah, I, and I, I do recollect that Mick speaking with Eric and Eric saying, you know, it took me 20 years to come back, to put a record out that was, you know, back to just blues that I started yeah. doing with Mail. He said, but you guys came out of the shoot doing that and doing yeah. it really, really well and with a mm. great deal of authenticity. And I, so I believe that he really had a great deal of respect for Peter and loved his playing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... He's it, one of the greatest blues guys ever. And just lastly, um, Dolly Parton. What was it like to work with Dolly Parton? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. Uh, I only worked with her a short while, and uh, uh, it was, let's shall we say, not my thing. Right. <laughs> uh, but it saved my life because I had, um, I had a, I had gotten married. I had we had a child that was on the way, just about to be born, and I had a house, and I bought a second house thinking that the first house would sell. So to make a long story short, I lost my job. And I went into this period where I spent every penny I had, and I was down to nothing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I get this call, you know, from from heaven or whatever, <laughs> saying, you know, would you be interested in do, do, doing a little tour with, Bonnie, with uh, Dolly Parton? I said, yes, I'll do it. It saved <laughs> my life. It brought, you know, it, it, I was on the brink of uh, wow. losing it all. But she was a very nice lady, I'll say that. Very, a genius singer, uh, perfect pitch, uh, mm -hmm. funny, um, and I enjoyed it a lot. Incredible. And is she is she from around where you are now, based now? Is she from that area? Yeah, I could probably drive to her house in about 25 minutes from here. But she grew up in East Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains near um, Pigeon Forge. And, 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 and so is Alison Krauss based near you, Alison Krauss? I believe she is, but I, I've only met her once. That uh, I don't know, really know her. I met her once. Right. Because Robert Plant, I think, is just actually doing a record with her at the moment. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. an interesting combination. Um, I believe that I've heard that Plant may have a, a place here also. There's a, there's a few Brits that have places <laughs> here or used to and come here often to, to, to uh, you know, record and such. Because I mentioned that because you would be the perfect person to play, to sort of interface those two people, you know, your guitar playing to link, you know. Well, let's get them on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're listening, Robert Plant, <laughs> this is yeah. a man here <laughs> that you should That's be talking nice. to. <laughs> I like his. Uh, I like that song he did, um, "Sea of Love." Early in when he did his first solo career, where he's totally yeah. different than than the vocalist style he did with uh, Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean, he just had an incredible sort of, probably much the same as you, where he's sort of um, bringing in some influences, some you know different influences from other cultures and 
music styles and and rather than um just rehashing what he did with led zeppelin which he could quite easily have been a cash cow for him well it was power to him to go in a different direction you know? yeah life is short oh, I, I, much hey, oh, speaking of, of that mm. that's one of the things i love about your playing i love that you're that you're so versatile uh i've, I've heard you play jazz very well i've heard you play a telly like a country style if you want to turn that on i've heard you play African, Mid-Eastern, so many different styles, rock and roll. I mean, you're the, you're the guy who would be, <laughs> you would be somebody's uh, secret weapon if, you, if they got a hold of you. So and I just, you know, not to, well, not to blow too much smoke here on each other, but I must say that I always enjoy what you put up. Thank you, man. That's like amazing that, you know, oh, that's like the best compliment I've ever had. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you're you. You're welcome. Sure. Well, uh, one of these is coming your way very soon because I've kind of almost making this pedal for you and your sound. I've been the listening. Fanciest looking pedal I've ever seen. I, <laughs> I, I wanted her on my uh, board just, just even if it didn't sound good, <laughs> and I'm sure it will because you're well, a tone master. I'm under pressure because you know you played all those dumbbells and. <laughs> well, you know, you know. So can I just to finish? Just to finish. Um, You've got this dumbbell that you've been using for 20 years, and now you've got your amp and your rig. Do you miss anything about the dumbbell? Are you like playing your slight because you you got this beautiful tone? Are you but are you thinking, I wonder what I would have sounded like with that dumbbell? Are you is, is that kind well, of well, yeah, I, I guess I guess I, you, you know then that I, I let the dumbbell go some years ago. But uh, you know, there are, as you know, some very good uh amplifier companies who make an amp that sound like a dumbbell and i have to say i have a couple that sound exactly like that so i do employ them from time to time to get that sound if i think that that's right for the song so you may be hearing some of that without knowing it on on my last couple of records wow well look rick it's, it's been amazing to chat to you and i know the viewers are going to be like oh why didn't you ask rick about this and that but literally your career has been so, you know, amazing and varied that we'd be here all night talking about it, you know, and I will get over there one day and we will have a, a share a beer or whatever. And we'll talk, <laughs> we'll get down I'm to really the nitty I missed you when we got to London. It, 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 it broke my heart that it, it was just, there was nothing available I could, I could, you know, give to you to, to come to the show or, no problem but, uh, you know, and the, and the rehearsals and everything were, you know, they were yeah. such that there was no free time. No but problem. anyway, we will you'll want always to get over there. You'll get here one of these days and we'll, we'll actually shake hands in the flesh. Uh, it would be amazing when we do. God bless and Rick, and thank you for everything. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.